So can anyone tell me where the web came from? Does anyone know any of the history when it comes to the internet? Brody does. The Cold War. Not the Cold War, but you're very, very close. Actually, it might be the Cold War. I might be getting this wrong. But does anyone else know any of the history of the internet? Where did it come from? How did it get so big? What the hell's going on? I am right. You are right. I, I misspoke. But guys and gals, funnily enough, like a lot of things, it was a US invention, okay? There was, there you go, is in the Cold War effort to try and improve communication across the battlefield or even across country, essentially. So the Department, Department of Defense in America got this agency together and they called it the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, ARPA meant for short. And essentially, they invented a technology to connect devices together so they could start communicating with each other. Okay, and then you would add on another one and another one and another one. And what they ended up doing was licensing it for defense and academic organizations in about the 1980s. Kaboom, it exploded. Hundreds of families and houses and businesses started joining the internet and sharing information and it just blossomed from there. Can anyone take a stab at how many devices are on the internet today? Too many is a really good answer. A hundred billion? Okay. So there is approximately 17 billion devices. Apparently that's IOT, but let's scroll down. Is there anything else? More IOT, what are you going on about IOT for? Okay, this is not helping. How many devices are connected? Yeah, let's just go with that. 14 billion, whatever. Like, that's a hell of a lot, isn't it? That is a lot of devices connected to the internet. Now, the one thing I want to quickly paint for you is that the internet, a lot of people sort of picture, if you were to draw a diagram of the internet, they'd probably think of it as a star. There's like this big thing in the middle and everyone's connecting to that big thing and that's where we get our web pages and our multiplayer games and all that kind of stuff. It actually isn't that at all. It's like the most disgusting spider web you've ever seen in your life. And this next little diagram is a great representation of that. This is a representation of major web servers around the internet that was mapped out a couple of years ago. Okay, so the bright stars are the big connected networks. They'd be like Google's and Microsoft's and Apple's and things like that. And the dimmer stars are either smaller servers or just devices connected to the internet. Okay, this is what the internet looks like. Why? Why is it a hodgepodge and a mesh and stuff that goes everywhere? Brody, come in. Everything's connected to everything. Everything is connected to everything. Why else? Why would we want a hodgepodge? Because the internet isn't one thing. That is absolutely 100% on the money. Anything else? It's also um, different servers around the world too, just for local reasons. Like there wouldn't be all of the servers in America. They have to connect to different databases in different countries, like here or in like Russia or other de different connections. And that's actually a really good point too. Um, you guys are obviously way too young for this, but I still remember when Google and Microsoft apps were not allowed to be used in schools. So online apps. So we're talking back when we had to use Microsoft Word on the computer and you couldn't save to the cloud, you had to save on a USB thumb drive or something like that. And the only reason we didn't have Google Apps was because there was no Australian server. And it was only until they made an Australian server that we could have the Google Apps here in schools in Australia. It was a bit of a licensing and privacy issue. But I'm going to rewind just for a quick second. So when the Cold War effort was going on and the Department of Defense decided they wanted to build this network. They had one goal in mind. Redundancy. So, if I quickly draw you a diagram, if I can, let's jump over to our friend of the light bulb, which is not open. Okay? So let's imagine Lachlan wants to connect over here with Brody. Okay? So here's Mr. Lachlan, and all the way over here is Mr. Brody. All right? If you imagine one of these guys is the front of the battlefield and one of the other guys is the commander, okay? Let's say Lachlan is telling Brody how to fight the war and they need to communicate. The simplest way to get these two to communicate is you get a piece of copper wire and you go squeaky, 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 and you connect them together, don't you? 
And now they can talk on the phone, they can send messages, they can do Morse code, all that kind of stuff. Sound pretty good? Cool, they're connected. However, Tarry, the deviant Tarry, off on the side, he doesn't want them to communicate. There's a couple of things Taryn could do. What's something you could do, Mr. Taryn? Take a my trusty pair of scissors. <laughs> Cut the line. They're gone. And it would take these guys longer to figure out what has happened than for Taryn to just snip another bit of the wire. He could just go snip, snip, snip. And you got to imagine that line might be kilometres long, 10, 20 kilometres. And they could snip it and these guys are screwed. That sucks, doesn't it? That's how communication used to happen in the war effort. They would run out these giant coaxial cables and they'd have to make sure that the enemy force doesn't bomb them or snip them or blow something up in between. The enemy force had a whole unit devoted to running into camps. Haven't you seen it? Like you've got the peons at the front and then you've got the guys running with scissors behind them. <laughs> They're very dangerous things, you know? What's something else Terry could do? Let's say he doesn't want to chop the wire. What's something else he might be able to do? He can, he can wire tap. This is just a piece of metal. So what if Taron runs his own little piece of metal? Ooh, now he's listening to everything these guys are saying. They might encrypt it, but then Taron's a smart guy. He decrypts it. Oh no, they're screwed. All right. <laughs> so with all that said and done, okay. Brody and Lockie go, is this ain't working? Terrence is he's a devious kind of fella. We need to fix this up. So what he does is these guys put in redundancy. Okay? First thing is, let's introduce another party. Okay? Let's put a just a repeater station, okay? I'm just gonna call it a node for this one. You can just imagine like the signal gets there, and we just send the signal on again. Alright, so same problem exists though, doesn't it? Taryn can just walk over and snip that one, but now Lachlan goes, well, between here and here, which is half the distance, that one's broken, so I can fix that. So solving, mild solve. However, what happens if Taryn just decides to nuke the node? There's a few more problems, I know, but what if he just bombs the node? Yeah. It's screwed. Yeah. It, that's even worse. So... Let me do these scissors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we're starting on Ah, <laughs> he's getting it. Let's start. Let's get some redundancy in there, guys. Redundant nodes that go all over the place, and then connect to here, connect to there. That might connect to over there. Um, this one might connect to there as well. That node's going mental. But as you can see, hey. So I'm going to take out two nodes. It's true. Yeah. Fine. If you really want to do that, let's meow, meow, meow. There you go. Good luck. <laughs> what if I just take out one of them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're doing good there. But look, as you can probably tell, what does it look like, Hayden? A web. It looks like a web, doesn't it? Welcome to the web, guys. Literally, this is the whole point. Redundancy so that when the enemy bombs or cuts a wire or does something, doesn't matter, this network can still send that message through in some other fashion. Okay? It is redundant, it's expensive, there's lots going on, but they don't care, it's the war effort. They'll put money into it if they want to. Okay? But welcome to the birth of the internet. Okay? And the reason that it's popular today is because there's just millions of people on it and there's lots to do, isn't there? Now, I've got a question for you. What's the difference between the internet and the web? Or the World Wide Web, I should be specific. What do you reckon, Brody? The internet's how you connect to it, and the web's just all the information. Got it in one. Mild round of applause. That was really good. Very mild. What do you think, you guys? So, that's a really important distinction. So, the internet is how you connect to things, okay? It's the plug that goes into the back of your modem that connects you to the internet all these other devices. Now, by the way, you might see on the internet that internet stands for international network. It does not. That is a misnomer. It actually stands just for inter-network. Not that exciting, is it? It's very unexciting. It's been a little bit of a portmanteau, but it's really just a term. Um, and the web, like Brody said, it's the content. It's the web pages, it's the social medias, it's the apps, okay? That is the World Wide Web. Whereas the internet is just connecting to that connecting to all the other devices around there. Does that make sense for you all so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fine, wait, wait. Um, 
Anyway. Yeah, you're right, mate. Okay. So, spewing forth, a bit of the history for the web. Anyone heard of the web? One, two, three? Yeah. A little bit? Web one is old school me. It's back in the day where essentially the web was considered read only. You would go to the web, you'd find a web page, you'd read the web page, you'd go, cool, now I know more. And then you'd move on with your life and you'd play StarCraft or Warcraft or whatever was popular back in the day. But essentially, like, you go to a web page, you just read, you just look. That was all the web was back then. Okay, I still have vivid memories of just going and reading lyrics from bands or reading histories of bands. I was really obsessed with my bands back in the day. And that's all I did in web one. And then obviously that changed a huge amount. We had this huge shift around the 1990s. Has anyone heard of uh, GeoCities? Yeah, the really crappy website you go to that have a million animated objects, the dancing baby that was around that time as well. They were horrible. However, yeah, they look so bad. <laughs> That's a great example of cheesy, right? <laughs> this is what they looked like. It was user-generated websites, and the benefit of GeoCities was you didn't have to know how to code a website from scratch. You only had to know a few little things. What's up there, Mr. Taron? No, not Taron, Val. Do you know about in the space Oh, the game? Yeah. yeah, I only know about it, though. Is it really? That that sounds scary. I might get PTSD, I think. What are yeah, like? Searching GeoCities make your phone get yeah, comic sounds? Apparently... Wait, what? Go back to that Well, when you like, type in GeoCities? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> did you know about that or did you just pick no, up on it in that split that. second? Yeah. Well, that, good, good eye, man. <laughs> Oh, that's so bad. Does anyone know where Comic Sans comes from? Like a readable font. No, it didn't actually get... People call it a readable font. It's a little bit... It was for a Microsoft. It was for the new... It was like a dumb thing. I forgot what it's Ooh, you're so goddamn close. Yeah. So Microsoft decided that the internet was really hard to access. And they, <coughs> and they went, what's comfortable to people? Their living room, right? Their house. Places like that. So what they did is they were inventing a thing called Microsoft Bob. And Microsoft Bob was essentially a lovely living room. And you could access, that's a terribly small photo. There's the dog. <laughs> so you could access parts of the internet just by clicking on things in the living room. So like if you want to read books, you click on the books. If you want to look at the calendar, you click on the calendar. So like you could do internet-y things in Microsoft Bob. Comic Sans was actually invented for Microsoft Bob. And that's, that was its origin story. Now, why did I bring that up? Because it's something to do with the internet. It's a nice little thing. Okay, so let's move on. So Web2, this is where GeoCities really pushed that idea that rather than having a static read-only web, why don't we let people generate things, we will remember it, and then anyone can access it. GeoCities was revolutionary in the idea that it hosted your website for free. And anyone could make their own thing about their own topic, and share it with the entire world. It was unheard of at that point. You guys are sitting there going, uh, who cares? We've got Reddit, we've got Facebook, we've got Wikipedia, who gives a crap? It was revolutionary back in the day, guys. The ability to make your own page and put it up there, oh, wow. So this is where we start getting things like social medias, okay? This is where MySpace starts becoming popular. Yes, I had a MySpace page back in the day. And then I transitioned to Facebook and went, this is crap, it'll never take off. Do you still make MySpace page? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Then, one of the big ones that really pushed this idea of user-generated content is JavaScript. Has anyone heard of JavaScript? Per chance, a couple of years? Don't confuse it with Java. No, it is not the same. Java is like you're making an Android app. JavaScript is you're making a web page app, essentially. But it added all this interactivity to the website that just didn't exist before. Now, the first sentence here probably expresses my opinion more than anything about Web3. Yes. I don't love it. Yes. NFTs. Crypto. Blockchain. Like 
crypto. I get the decentralization. Yeah. The, the metaverse. Yeah, it's just sometimes it gets taken too far into the wrong areas. And like, this is this is the thing, like tech like, heads. You don't like crypto and NFTs and your metaverse. <laughs> tech heads take this stuff and they run with it and they go, blockchain's going to solve all of our problems. AI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Blockchain's so cool, but then it had to be the crypto thing. Yeah. Yes. And then it immediately just got stunted from there. It was like, great thing. And then, and then it had to be ruined, and now everyone like hates it. Okay, so let me quickly talk about Web3 is the idea that we are now trying to decentralize control. Now, I just told you before there's no center to the internet, though, didn't I? Who has control? Google. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon. There's the, the big five, they call them. Hey? That's it. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Google. They are the top five, and they own like essentially 70 or 80% of the web from memory. It's insane how much they hold, and I would love to be corrected on that number in a second if you can find it. The idea is we take away control from them. No longer are they gonna have control of our data. No longer are they gonna, oh, they're calling it Netflix. Microsoft's much bigger than Netflix. Um, and then all this other stuff got attached on the end, okay? Crypto and NFTs, they sort of went, oh, this is a lovely place for us to live. Let's live on the Web3. Now, to explain, what the hell is blockchain? Now, if you imagine, let's say I have a file on my computer, and I want to share it with all of you guys. Okay, I would put it on a server, and then you guys would access the link or the file from that server, right? Make sense? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Not a hard concept. Blockchain is the idea that I take this file, I put it onto the blockchain, and it gets chopped into tiny little pieces, essentially shredded into pieces. And every single person on the blockchain, not every single person, but a good chunk, would get one little tiny piece of that file. Better get a bit, Dobby get a bit, Lockie get a bit, Chloe get a bit, all that kind of stuff. And then when I try and access the file, I've got to pull all those little pieces from all those people, put it all together, and there it is. There's my file. It is very inefficient. <laughs> so there is another step. They have tried to make it a simpler process in the idea that you do get all the shreds. The original still lives there. And those shreds are used to validate, to make sure it's still the original. I still remember sitting through a presentation where this IT guy that worked at a private school said, blockchain's going to fix everything. <laughs> Stood in front of like 100 IT people saying, our school, everything's on the blockchain. Every document a kid makes, it's on the chain. Every Minecraft level they make on the chain. And why? Because who wants Google having all of your stuff? And I, I feel like saying, do I care? Like, why would we care about where my data is? Google aren't stuffing around with it. They're not fifling, siphoning through my files going, ah, look at that. They, they're not doing that crap. So, I don't know. I've just got this, I've got a bit of hatred because... It's a solution looking for a problem. Yes. Somebody made this really complex, amazing system, and they're like, what can we do with it? I'm gonna get the money. Exactly, yeah. NFTs. And NFTs come along. If you don't know non-fungible tokens, the idea that we take a picture or a document or an item, and you put, put it through a process that creates essentially a license, and then one person gets to own that license. So here, Tommy, here is your license for your monkey. And then he goes, hey guys, look at this. I've got a monkey and it's mine. Everyone goes, cool. Right click, save as. Now it's mine. But he goes, no, but I've got a certificate. And we go. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I still don't get it. The coolest thing to make fun of NFTs is the non-fungible trend in D&D. It's a player made item where you have this really overpowered weapon that can kill everything. But it's locked in a vase, uh, a safe uh, at the bottom of the ocean, but you can never get it. But you do have a picture of it, and a signed certificate that says it's yours, and it can be very easily copied by rolling over a table. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. So look, I don't like the Web3. I think it's a bit of a... I think it's a bit of a flash in the pan. I think, again, it's a solution looking for a problem. All right. I get the idea. I like the idea of decentralization, but it's not solving the problems that I have with the Web. 
All right, but here's the bit that I actually want to talk about, applications of web programming. So what are some of the things that we can do? Well, we can make games that people can play together. We can make online banking apps. We can make interactive content. We can share resources and we can just make full blown web apps. So online banking, hands up if you've got a banking app on your phone or on the computer or something. Okay, everyone better come. Beautiful. I've got my teacher's mutual banking app on my phone that I access quite often, as you can imagine. When I click on my teacher's mutual banking app, well, I'm not showing you my numbers. numbers you've got going on this, uh, hey? What are all those funny little numbers you've got in your bank? It's my giant bank account. No, it's probably my debt more than anything. <laughs> but when I open this up, you may not know it, and I didn't, didn't know it for a while. This is actually a web page. It looks like an app, behaves like an app, even does things like fingerprint scanning that an app normally would do. This is actually a web page, believe it or not. Okay? Same thing with interactive content. When you download the YouTube app, I actually had YouTube bug out the other day on my phone and the address bar appeared at the top. <laughs> Never seen that before in my life. After an update, I was watching something, it went into the YouTube app and then the full screen stuffed up and all of a sudden I had the address at the top inside the YouTube app. And no, that wasn't a mistake. That was just the app bugging out hard. So we can make interactive apps on the web now, which is fantastic. So being able to upload things, download things, comment on things, it's good. Hands up if you do online games. Just curious to see. Yeah? A little bit. Most of the single player, I'm guessing, guys. <laughs> All right. But moving along, this is the bread and butter of this topic. WPA, a progressive web app. The idea that we can make a website using just web technologies, just bare basic stuff. If you did any web page stuff, in year nine and 10, then you're gonna be able to use this here in this topic, okay? And what it allows you to do is write one website that runs on desktop computers, doesn't matter if it's a Windows or Mac or Linux or whatever. You can run it on mobile phones, doesn't matter if it's an Android or iOS or, holy crap, if you're using Tizen, I'm really worried about you. Windows Phone? Oh yeah, I'm really worried about you there. <laughs> um, or even like a tablet. The same website will work on every single platform. It will behave the same, it'll have the same code and the same functionality. You write it once, it works on everything. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, the other beauty of the WPA platform is you can actually write it, so if you are on a mobile device, you can actually use some of the devices. Like I said, my banking app has fingerprint scanning. Well, I can write an app that uses the fingerprint scanner. I can also write a website that uses the phone camera, Bluetooth, location data, all that kind of stuff, Terran. It's PWA, right? Yep. Cool. Fantastic. PWA. WPA is a Microsoft technology that I used to teach. So keep correcting me if I keep saying that. So WPA. Thank you. Progressive Web. Oh my God. P P W A. I'm glad you're listening. Thank you. All right. So my next question is: Who here has used a PWA app? You don't know, do you? I mean, How many of you have been to a website on Google or something and there's a little download button at the top here? Central. Oh, does Central do it, does it? Yeah. On my phone, at least. Yeah, I like it's not doing it for me, but that's probably because it's not the parent like model. Oh, what is it? It's like play.spotify, wherever it is. Open.spotify. There it is right there. That's a W. Uh, what? <laughs> it's a PWA app. Okay, so that tells us it's a progressive web app because it's got this little download button. And if you really want to dig deep, this is something we're going to learn later on. If I jump into F12, which I know you guys love, like modifying your scores, getting 100%. If I go to application, right here, this is going to tell me all about the PWA what it's doing, what the message is. There's the service worker, which we're gonna talk about very soon, and all sorts of stuff. All right, so that's how you know it's a PWA, if you get that little download button. And if you go to your phone, like you said, guys, you'll probably get the same little prompt. Why do we do PWAs? You write one website, it'll work across everything. We call that cross-platform, right? Doesn't matter what platform, in other words, Microsoft, Apple, Linux, it'll work. It is low cost because 
Writing an Android app and an iOS app from scratch, they are quite expensive. Writing a website, cheap as chips, really easy. You don't have to install a PWA, they can just go straight to your website and start using it. Or if they download it, they can install it. You can actually use them offline as well. So if you download a PWA, and then you go to the middle of Australia where there's no service, the app will still work, despite not being online. It says faster UI, mm, mild disagree. And the last one, low data consumption, completely fair, because it doesn't have to download stuff. Native apps, they are platform specific. If you write an Android app, you also have to go and write an iOS app. There are things that allow you to write both, but you have to learn them. And again, it's still writing completely things separate to a web page. High cost, fair enough, takes more effort. Installation required, high performance, that's fair. Uh, not indexed by Google, what does that mean? Bingo. Yep, can't search on Google. And requires updates. Fair enough. Most apps do. How do they work? Now, this is the interesting part. So, if you come over here with your eyeballs, for everybody, here's our app on the far left hand side. This is our PWA app. So, let's say we open up Spotify. Spotify, first of all, we download everything about Spotify the pictures, the data, and the back end stuff, and it loads up the app. Now, the first thing the app will do is talk to its service worker. It's SW, I'm calling it in the text. The service worker is a special little script that runs in the background, and it literally its job is to do one thing. It says, am I online or am I offline? If it's online, what it will do is it will go over to the servers, the Spotify servers and say, Hey, give me all the newest stuff, give me all the new songs, give me all the new artworks, give me all the new whatever's, playlists. And then it sends it back to the app so you can see all your lovely songs and playlists. Sound pretty good so far? Cool. If for whatever reason you are in the middle of Australia and you really want to listen to your favourite song, you open up Spotify and the service worker goes, oh crap, I'm offline. What it does is it accesses the cache. So it goes into your files and it says, gimme, 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 gimme. You've already got the photos, you've already got the playlists. Now, the disadvantage there is you don't get the newest stuff, do you? It's whatever you had last time you used the app. But the beauty is it'll still send all that data back to you and you can still use it while you're offline. How do we think about that, guys and gals? Is that pretty good? Yep. It's a local copy rather than online. Last slide, by the way. Example apps. So these are some PWAs that you may have used in the past. I literally used Uber a couple of weeks ago. The app works really well, surprisingly. Pinterest, it also, I hate Pinterest so much. 2048, and finally, we literally just looked at Spotify, so you guys are good. Uh, I hate it because it flooded Google Images. So you search for just one thing, and all of a sudden, 500 Pinterest results. I literally have an extension called Unpinterested. And any Google image search I do, it takes out all Pinterest results. I should use that. It's really good. All right.